uh, in my uh, preparation process, one of my kind of habits or whatever is on Saturday, I like to sit down with my sermon and read through it and just kind of go over it in my head. And it's written by that time, usually, hopefully, and, um, and, and just kind of like to work through it. And my daughter, my youngest daughter yesterday saw me reading through my sermon. She goes, you're, you're preaching again, Dad? And I said, yep. And she goes, don't you think people are tired of listening to you? <laughs> I hope not. I think she's tired of listening to me, I think was the message that she was uh, really ultimately getting at. I, uh, I, one of the things that I sometimes do with my older daughters, and you guys have experienced this in, in various ways, is sometimes they're, they have like these series that they watch on Netflix, or they'll be watching some movie, and I'll, I'll kind of come in and sit down with them, try to spend a little time. So I'll jump into the middle of something. And over the course of, they're kind of in like this superhero genre stuff that they have going on right now. And so I'll start asking all these questions like, who's this guy? Or what they do, why did he do that? Or what's going on? Or what are these people fighting about? And I start asking like a million different questions. And ultimately, like I can start to eventually get like this disgruntled look on my kid's face as I'm kind of like ruining the moment for them. Like you're all shaking your head like that would ruin it for me too. Like um, as I try to like catch up with them. And, and as I was thinking about that, um, I, I was thinking about the passage that we're looking at today together. And, and I really sort of related to that experience with this, this passage in Ephesians 5, where Paul is going to talk about marriage. Because I would say previously, my interaction with these, these verses have been primarily about looking at and trying to understand the husband and wife relationship. But I have not previously viewed it in the overall trajectory of Paul's like thought process, the logic that he's building throughout the book, which is actually really critical in grasping what Paul wants us to understand as the church about marriage, about, about relationships, and about how our faith impacts all of that. The flow of Paul's thought in, in these verses and leading up to this point is really extraordinary. So last week, if you were here with us, we looked at how the reality of the gospel is reorienting our lives. How, how when we've been instructed by Paul in this new life in Christ to put on the new self. And the new self, this new identity, comes with a new way of of doing things, or, or at least it should. That's Paul's instruction. Saying, don't live in the old self. You are a new self, a new identity. Live in that. So Paul begins in chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, by saying this. He says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So now Paul is going in this, this continuation of the outworking of the gospel. Paul is going to help the church understand how our new life in Christ results in new relationships. So if the primary question that we sought to look at last week was, how does my faith in Jesus affect the way I live? The question that we want to deal with this, way, this week is, how does my faith in Jesus impact my relationships? And before we jump into these verses, I, I want to just kind of note or highlight a little bit of the cultural context that, that Paul is, is writing into when he writes this letter. As early back as the 4th century BC, the Greek philosopher Aristotle had developed like these household codes that were used to, to instruct men in that culture how they could govern their homes. Specifically, it dealt with, with their relationship to their wife um, or wives in that culture, their relationship to their children, and their relationship with their slaves, specifically in that order. It was uh, a, a male-dominated patriarchal culture, and wives and women and, and children and slaves were all seen as subordinates. These household codes throughout the course of time become really uh, key in their overall understanding of society and how they operate in that world. They were widely understood and they were widely adhered to within the context that Paul is now going to speak into. 
And in that, there is a clear hierarchy. There was, there was the patriarch, there was the husband, and then there was everyone else under his leadership and his authority. But Paul now, once again, is, is going to teach the church about how the gospel impacts our lives how it infiltrates every area, how he's called us to be unified and to walk in our new life. And he's going to apply this impact now into our relationships, and he does so by using these same, these same household categories that were so familiar in that culture and context. Paul's now going to speak into these, and he's going to use these same codes. He's going to address husband and wives, parents and their children, slaves and their masters. However, instead of placing the authority in the position of the husband or the patriarch, Paul is going to show us what it looks like when people, when followers of Jesus are simultaneously living under the authority of Jesus. And today, as we, we spend time together looking at this, we're going to specifically key in on these verses that apply to marriage, where Paul begins to reframe their understanding of the marriage relationship in light of the gospel. Before we open up Ephesians, let's, let's pray one more time. Father, as we think about these verses today, Lord, we think about um, the nature of marriage and what you've designed. Lord, I pray that we would understand how your gospel impacts one of the foundational and critical relationships, not only of our culture and society, but of this body called the church and, and of our lives. God, give us wisdom and understanding and hearts to listen to you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's turn together to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to pick things up in verse 21 and, uh, and read through the end of the chapter. This is what Paul writes. He says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. And now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. And husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that, he might be present, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church." Because we are members of his body, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So, Paul is writing into this drastically different culture. And now he begins to present a drastically different idea of, of marriage. And I want us to take a few moments just to, to unpack this and perhaps even see some things that, that our own culture, our own society could benefit from. And it begins by understanding that marriage is a shared submission. Marriage is a shared submission. I don't even know if you can sort of think back to, or some of you are, are relatively newlyweds or young marrieds or that sort of thing, but if you can think back to that moment when you're getting married, there's a lot of people that will come alongside of you and, and seek to give you advice. I remember like my grandfather like putting his arm around me and saying, Sterling, just remember, I'm sorry, I was wrong, it won't happen again. Like if you can just remember that phrase, you're gonna avoid so much like his grandfatherly wisdom to me in that moment, right? There's, there's people that will tell you how important it is to reserve like a regular date night and, and that's good advice. There's people that will say it's important to be spontaneous. You gotta make sure that you don't just fall into a rut and that's good advice. 
People will refer to what Ephesians says and say, don't go to bed angry. Make sure that you resolve these issues before you go to bed. That's, that's referring to Ephesians chapter 4, and that's good advice. They'll tell you that communication is the key, and that, that is good advice. There's no shortage of good advice. There's no shortage of bad advice, for that matter. But, but none of it supersedes what Paul is telling us here in verse 21, where he says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. There, there's, there's two surprises here in, this, in verse 21. The first is to understand that the key to marriage isn't great communication, romance, and regular date nights, although all of that is important. The key to, to marriage, to a marriage relationship, according to Paul, is reverence for Christ. This, this phrase is, is absolutely essential in Paul's understanding because it roots all authority in the position and person of Jesus. So there, there's an outworking of our obedience to him. Jesus is at the center of this entire relationship, of his whole argument here. So, so for as you love him, as you're obedient to him, then we learn to submit to each other. And in doing so, we are ultimately submitting to him. In, in order for us to love well in our lives, we first have to surrender to Surrender ourselves to the love of Jesus. It's interesting that this, these verses have been used throughout history, oftentimes, to deal with the question of authority and marriage. And, 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 and seek to answer the question, like, who is, who's ultimately the boss? Who has the final say in marriage? And I think that there's no avoiding what this text says. There, there's no sort of skirting around it. As it relates to the topic of authority, it's clear. It's Jesus. Jesus is our authority in marriage, in relationships, what he's done in it. He is to be our, our guide. I, uh, several years ago, actually many years ago now, at a at previous church, I had a student come to me and let me know that his dad had informed the family that he was leaving, um, that, he was, that he was walking out on him. And as you would imagine, this a high school student. He was distraught and upset. And he knew that things weren't good, but he just didn't see it happening um, and, and just was asking for his advice. And so over the course of time, um, I actually had an opportunity to go sit down with his dad and just talk and try to understand what was going on and see if there was any way that I could try to encourage or, or, or provide hope or give some kind of um, um, instruction that, that would say, hey, let's see if there's maybe a way to work this out. And over the course of that conversation, um, it was interesting because the, the husband, the dad, ended up citing Ephesians 5 to me as some of the reasons behind why he was leaving his wife, um, which was obvious there was some selective reading going on in, in his heart. And, and I challenged him on that. And I tried to push back and say, I don't think you're understanding this correctly. And here is, and he, and he just kept going. And over the course of the conversation, what I discovered is that the, the, the relationship with his wife wasn't the, fun, the foundational problem. Um, it, it was his relationship with Jesus. Like that, that's where the authority issue for him was at play. Um, and that's why, because he was unwilling to submit to the model of Jesus, he was ultimately crumbling. And it's not that everyone else was perfect in the scenario. They weren't. But that was the foundational issue that, that he was struggling with. Because this leads us to the second surprise here that is in this first verse, which is that submission is mutual. And I've, I've already alluded to this, but I think the degree to which this would have been counterculture to those who are receiving this letter at that day and age, it's hard for us to wrap our heads around. I, like, I'm trying to imagine how many times the Christians in, in Ephesus reread this to make sure that they are hearing Paul correctly. Like, this is absolutely, unequivocally a, a new way of thinking of what Paul is describing here. So what does it mean for us to submit? You know, there's two words that are used in the Greek. One of them carries like the idea of involuntary sort of positional submission. I'm the dad, you're the child, you should obey. But that's not the word that Paul uses here. 
The Greek word that he uses here means to yield, to place under, to subject oneself. You see, it's, it's a voluntary submission. And, and the, the tense of this verb re, re, uh, is, is middle voice reflective. So it's, it's saying it's a continual process. Paul, Paul is saying to the Christ followers in Ephesus that they're called to continually, voluntarily place each other under the authority of the other person. To place themselves under the authority of the other person. It means when we talk about the idea of submitting one to another, it means that we lay aside our own needs, our own wants, our own desire to have our way, and we put that aside to seek the good of the other person. You see, Paul is telling us that this should be happening simultaneously. And I think at first glance, when we think about this, this is almost sort of hard to wrap our heads around. And I think outside of the gospel, it's, it's impossible. You know, oftentimes when we get into these conversations culturally, it, it begins and ends with the idea of equality. And again, equality is, a, is, a, is Paul teaches equality. But I think what he's teaching us here with the idea of mutual submission actually goes a step further. It, go, it goes beyond that. As one author, uh, author notes, he says, with equality, you still have a battle of rights. Equality can exist without love, but it will not create a Christian community. With mutual submission, we give up rights and support each other. Mutual submission is love in action. Now, it's, it's painful that, that we have to say this, but Paul is not advocating for a... a um, he's not telling us that we remain in abusive situations. This is not an indication that, that, that... And if you look at the example of Jesus and of Paul's life, neither of them were, were pushovers, although they both modeled what he's describing to us here. Of course, this is not referring to a situation where a spouse or another person is being abusive. That's not what mutual submission looks like. Obviously, it wouldn't be mutual if one person is doing that. And that's not what Paul is saying here when he's instructing us as men and women to submit to each other. See, mutual submission is a strong and free act of the will based on real love for the other person. And now it's into this context that Paul is going to help us understand what it looks like to relate to each other as Christians, as husband and wife. Because marriage is shared submission, but it is also a shared devotion. It's a shared devotion. I have the privilege uh, as a pastor of standing with people when they are speaking their vows to each other. And, and being in that moment and... and and being able to speak just a word of encouragement or some instruction in, in, in to that setting. And it's sort of humbling because I realize that I can't remember a single word that my pastor said to me when I was standing up there getting married. Anybody that's been married over five years, can you remember a word that your pastor said? It's so disheartening for us pastors, you know. No one's listening to us. Jesse and Ashley, I did their wedding last week. They better still be able to remember. They just got back from their honeymoon. They better be able to remember one word. So I've sort of realized this. And, and I've understood that in that moment, what, what is it that is the best that I can hope for? What is it that you would seek to accomplish? And I've sort of decided that in my heart of hearts in that moment, all I want to be able to do is point that couple to Jesus. If I can be able to say to them, when you're thinking about what it's going to look like for you to, to love your wife well, what is it going to look like you for, for you to love your husband? Let me point you back to the model of Jesus and how he's loved us. And I think this is the exact same logic or thought that Paul is using here. Because we're going to get into this middle section of, of the verses, which can, we can almost sort of turn our brains off because the, the, the language of it sounds offensive in our culture. But I want us to try to unpack this in light of, again, the overall trajectory of what Paul has been teaching us in Ephesians. This is back in verse 22 through verse 30. He says, wives, submit to your husbands, to your own husbands, as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. 
Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to everything to their husbands. And husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. There's this this intermingling here, where, where Paul's talking about marriage, and he's talking about the husband and wife relationship, but he's also talking about the church, and what Christ has done in the church, and what he does through the church. And so there's, there's, there's confusion about what Paul is trying to say. But I think when we look back at this and, and we understand that Paul has been instructing the early church what it looks like in the context of, of marriage to follow the example of Christ. See, one of the common criticisms that was levied, that was brought against the church in the early society was that they were trying to dismantle their cultural, their societal norms. So, so all their talk about uh, equality, about Jews and Gentiles being the same, all their talk about freedom in Christ and, and loving people unconditionally, that this was going to tear down the way that their society worked. It was, it was a common argument that was brought against the church, and it would be particularly used as it relates to these household codes that were so foundational in their way of doing things. And this is what's so brilliant about what Paul does here. Because he takes this existing hierarchy and and the use of authority in that culture, and he applies the reality of Jesus, the work of Jesus, into it, over it, into their system. So what we discover in these verses is is examples of, of mutual submission to each other. Examples of what this looks like in the context of the marriage relationship. And what's so different about what Paul outlines here in comparison to the the household codes that were utilized in their culture is now responsibility is not just placed in under those who were under authority. It's not just placed on women and on children and on slaves, but it's placed on those who held authority and power. It's placed on the, the, the patriarch, and, and both, it says, can look to the model of Jesus and understand how this is done, by what, what is it he has done for the church. So he talks about the idea of submitting, and what does it mean to submit, and, and what does it mean to submit one to another. And he talks about it, laying down our rights for the benefit of the other person, for the benefit of our spouse. And how do we know what that looks like? How do we know how to do that? We look to Jesus. When he talks, when he says to the husband, to to love your wife like Christ loved the church, to love sacrificially, to give yourself up for the benefit of the other person, how do we know how to do that? What that looks like and what that means. We, We look to what Jesus has done for us. You see, this... What Paul is describing here is not a standard that's being imposed on us. This is is what's been poured out to us. We've received it. We've been the benefactors of it. Now Paul wants us to understand it and and how to live it. This is in Philippians, which is one of my favorite just, this is chapter 2, favorite descriptions of exactly what Paul is, is talking about here. And he points us to Christ. So he says this, he says, Again, this is Philippians 2, 1 through 8. He says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, so he's saying if you've benefited at all from from what Christ has done in you, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord with and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry and conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. 
Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Listen to this. Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. This is this model of Jesus submitting to the will of the Father for the benefit of what he was going to accomplish for us. But he made himself nothing, taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. So what Paul has just instructed us as husbands and wives to do in our relationship in, in Philippians, he says, let me tell you what Jesus has done for you and how he has modeled this to us. What does it mean for, for me to submit, for anyone to submit? It, it means that they lay down their lives for the sake of the other person. What does it mean to love like Christ loved the church? It means I lay down my desire, my will, my my me for the sake of the other person and it's just so fascinating how in the midst of all of this paul is weaving in all of this theology about the church which helps us ultimately understand not only the purpose of marriage relationships but also of the church which gary thompson in his book sacred marriage says marriage is isn't about making us happy it's about making us holy see when when Sherry and I are living this out, and, and it's worth noting that one of the challenges when you preach a sermon on a text like this is that Paul's giving us something, something of an ideal situation here, like when we're doing this together, but we all know that that's not necessarily how reality is, and, and I'm not saying that like, I'm saying there's times in, in my marriage relationship when my wife is far more... Um, uh, intentionally modeling Jesus to me than I am in the relationship. Um, we don't always do that equally. But Paul, when he's saying, when we're living this out together, as Christ has modeled it to us, when, when we are serving each other, it serves to draw us closer individually to Jesus, that she helps me become the person that God has intended and designed me to be. And that when I am doing this for her, the same can happen, which is, again, what, what is, is being modeled here. It's just, this is also the purpose of the church, of this community. One of the questions that, that often gets asked when we study these verses is, is, Paul, is Paul teaching us a specific, is he teaching us specific roles in the marriage relationship? Um, and as you can imagine, that is, that is a highly debated question. Um, and, and, and has been looked at for centuries. Verse 23 says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. So is Paul teaching a specific leadership role for the husband in the marriage relationship? And again, I think we have to read this in the context to which Paul wrote into. He, to, to, to ask about the husband's authority in that culture wasn't a question. It was an assumption. They lived with it and understood it every day. It was known by everyone. So Paul, speaking into this community, he says, Husbands, as the one who carries the authority, lead the way. You are the one who is in the position to lay down your rights. The other people have already primarily culturally laid down their rights. So the husband had a leadership role. But it wasn't to boss, it wasn't to exert authority or privilege, but rather to lead the way in giving up himself for the benefit of the other. See, this is where the power laid in what Paul was saying, is that it was so radically different from what they understood. And any time we would read Ephesians chapter 5 and we would use it to, to make women subservient to their husbands, we're misunderstanding Paul's foundational, fundamental point. This isn't what he's talking about. Paul is showing us the impact of the gospel in our marriages and in the power structures of their day and of ours. And neither is this advocating leadership. It's not a giving up of it. Paul is saying where you have authority, and ultimately, if you look at the whole trajectory of his thought, where, you, where you're under authority, live in submission, uh, mutual submission to each other and to Jesus. 
So this is, this is our call as men and as women, as married or as single, to lay down our rights for the benefit of those that God has put around us because we have a shared devotion to Jesus. Because this is what he has modeled to us. Lastly, we understand that marriage is a shared covenant. A shared covenant, and this is really critical. This is back in, in verses 31 through 33. It says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm, not, and I, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. See, Paul here in these verses, and I, I bolded that, that phrase, hold fast, he's referring to uh, or referencing Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, when he says this. And if you can remember, if you've ever signed a mortgage, if you can remember what it was like to sign that contract, right? There was all these if-then statements. If I'm late on a payment, then this is what happens. If I ultimately default on my mortgage, this is what's happening. There's page and page and page after if-then statements. And that's called a contract. But this isn't what, what Paul's describing here. This isn't what Genesis is teaching us. He's teaching us, and we use this word, hold fast. That, that's sometimes translated united, or I think in the King, uh, King James Version, it was like, cleave right you you cleave uh, a, a husband leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife that's the the hebrew word for covenant timothy keller describes a covenant as a deep exclusive permanent legal personal binding commitment you see these aren't if thens this isn't and this is again this is not what jesus modeled to us Jesus didn't say, if you are good enough, if you work hard enough, if you accomplish enough, then. He's saying, this is a covenant. I'm all in entirely, regardless. This isn't, this isn't when you speak your marriage vows, that's not a promise of, of current love. That's easy to do. You look your best in that moment. It's the promise of future love, which is exactly what Jesus has modeled to us. And what I love about these verses is that in verse 32, when he says this mystery is profound, I'm saying that it refers to Christ in the church. I think what Paul's teaching us here is that this, this sort of love, this commitment, is, is, is evangelistic. That when I am loving my wife the way Christ loved the church, when we are mutually submitting to each other and laying down our rights for the benefit of the other person, that will point people to a love that's greater than, than of ourselves. It's greater than, than what human love can produce. It, it points them to Jesus. And it points them to what God has done on our behalf. I, uh, I'm reminded of a story, and I'll, I'll wrap up with this, but um, Robertson McQuillan, who is a professor at Columbia Bible College, shares the story of, of his wife's um, deterioration from Alzheimer's. And it... it stuck with me because of my own sort of grandparents' journey and watching my grandma deteriorate and my grandfather um, walk alongside her in the midst of that. But he tells the story about how um, later on when he would speak and he would travel and do all these sorts of things, it became necessary for him to have her with him all the time. He was just this loving, doting husband on his wife. But if you've ever been around Alzheimer's, you know how taxing and exhausting that can be. Um, because they're constantly asking the same questions and needing the same things. And he was traveling on uh, for a speaking engagement. His wife was with him in the airport, and they got up, and she would need to go kind of walk down the hall and ask the same questions. It was going back and forth through her seat, and he would get up with her and walk with her. And they had done this about seven or eight times, he said. And, um, and in that moment, they were getting up, and they walked by this woman who was who was sitting on her computer and she sort of mumbled something. And so um, Robert thought that, that they had offended her, that they were just kind of annoying her with their back and forth. And so he, he started to apologize. He said, oh, I'm sorry. And he's like, what? And I think he asked her, like, what did you say? Or, or, and she responded in that moment. She says, I wonder if I'm ever going to uh, find somebody who will love me like that. And that is pointing people. 
to a greater love. That's pointing people to something bigger than, than what we do in our human form. It's pointing people to something greater than, than what society, culture, all that offers. Um, it's ultimately pointing them to Jesus. And this is what Paul says, this is the power of, of our relationships. When we lay down our rights um, for the people around us, would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be together in your house. Lord, to look at your instructions and to think about what that means and how do I live that out and what, what will that mean for my own marriage relationship? What does it mean for me to love Sherry like you love the church? What does it mean for me to, to um, submit to one another? Lord, show us more of how to do that so that in doing that, we can show people more of you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.